and the worship team, Brandon, all of you, it's good to have you here this morning, and uh, I, I just want to do what I love to do and ask you to just to turn to the person, not next to you, but in the row behind you. You probably came with someone you know, so just turn to the person behind you, in front of you, and say, welcome to church. It's good to be in the Father's house. This is my name. This is who I am. It's good to have you here. It's important that we, that we always just greet one another. So in that, I also want to ask if there's anyone visiting us for the very first time, um, can I just see by the raise of the hand if there's someone welcome here? We would just like to give you a hand and make you feel welcome. It's good to have you here. So we will just hand out a visitor's card to you just now. So trust that you will enjoy it with us this morning. And then also the, the ushers, wait you guys. Uh, we will just receive the offering. And then for the, the kids or the children, um, I think Christine is on Kitty's Church this morning. So all the kiddies, you can leave for Kitty's Church. Um, you can go there to the back. There's Tani, Christine. Um, so all of you can just follow all the young ones. You are welcome to join for Kitty's Church this morning. It will be during for the duration of the, of the sermon or the message. So uh, I know she's got some very practical and nice things prepared for you this morning. So uh, trust that you will enjoy that. I have to remember everything this morning. All the staff is basically on leave. My wife is in South Africa. Her mom stands, is turning 70 and her sister 40. And JP and Marlies also have some leave. They were visiting Daryl, uh, Derek and Beryl Puffett there in Pretoria. So uh, it's a, it's a one-man show in a sense this morning. But uh, I, I don't even want to mention that word show. So please don't read something into that. I, I, I despise that word in the church. It should never ever be like that. It's just a way of saying that it's uh, me and myself. But nevertheless, good to have Sebastian. Okay, awesome. Um, last week we didn't do it, but this week if there's teenagers in the house, I think those 12 or 13 or older, um, you can just go to, to pull. I, I, um, yeah, she loves to spend time with you. So if there's young people ages 12, 13 to 18, um, you are welcome to join Pool there in the foyer. She's got a heart to, to make disciples as well and to spend time with you. So you are welcome to, to join her this morning. For the rest, it's great to have you here. Um, I don't usually welcome uh, people specifically. My, oh, Freddy, I could have you seen for Ogen. Where are you? Hey, come. It's a pleasure to have you I just want to say, good to have you here, Freddy. Freddy is living in South Africa, there in the garden route in uh, George. And uh, yeah, Freddy, just great to see your smile and your. It's great that you come and visit us while you are here in Swakop. So uh, bless you as well. So this morning, I want to share a little bit and start. Um, last week, it was Easter weekend, and uh, I spoke and shared a little bit um, about everything surrounding that theme. Um, about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is, which is also the foundation and at the heart of the gospel message that we preach. And uh, I specifically spoke a little bit about how, in terms of, the, of communion or the Lord's Supper, we will also have communion this morning. It's the first Sunday of a new month. It's April already. So uh, every, every first Sunday of a new month, we celebrate communion or have communion. And I want to encourage you to do it as often as you want to. There's no law regarding that. We are free um, so every day of the week you can have communion at home if you want to in your small group or, or wherever. But as a church we, we, we also celebrate communion. And it's important because last week the, at the heart of the message or the foundation of the message was how do we remember Jesus during the Lord's Supper, during communion. And I spoke and referred a little bit to, to the what and the why, why Jesus died um, and what, um, what happened during that time. Um, I'm still personally chewing a little bit. I, I said in terms of the why Jesus died, I gave you 50 reasons from John Piper's book, 50 Reasons Why Jesus Died. Um, I recommend that you read it. It's good stuff. I'm still chewing on that in a sense. So if we have to go back more or less 2,000 years, um, we see that the, the, for the people or in, in terms of redemptive history, that was a time where Jesus was already crucified, the grave was empty, he is risen, uh, he was alive, he was appearing to people, 
um, during that time period. So it's in a sense, I was, when I was praying, it came to mind, and I thought I must really get my theology right now, because was it already the birth of the church, or was the birth of the church only after Pentecost? But it was also in this in-between time and season where Jesus died on the cross, where he rose again, there were testimonies that the grave was empty, and there was this 40 days period before Jesus' ascension, and there after Pentecost and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, we Peter stood up and preached his first sermon and I think that's basically where the, the early church was birthed and the first people were added to the church so it was also in this, this in between time in a sense so this morning I just want to quickly, it's, it's almost that, that 40 days in between and where do I get that? I just briefly want to read you from Acts um, chapter 1 verse 1 to 5 we Luke is writing and he says, In this first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during the forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So that's basically where that 40 days come from. And I think I've written it, I made a, mess, a note, little note. I think it's on the 9th of May, according to our calendars. There will be a public holiday, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that is Ascension Day. So if we have to go back to, to, to basically the New Testament um, narrative, we would see Jesus died, Jesus rose again. It's in this in-between 40 days uh, where Jesus ascended, and after that it was Pentecost, pouring out of the Holy Spirit um, to the church and the people. And we see Jesus basically presented himself alive to them. Now, I made a little note to myself to, to speak slowly, it stands here in the little car. I, I want to speak slowly. And actually this morning as we prayed before, interceded before the church service, um, we actually just spoke a little bit and then we prayed. And, you know, I said one of the things I, I want to pray for, what we actually prayed for, is that, you know, we live in a day and an age, and, and, and you know there's WhatsApp and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and a lot of church, uh, and a lot of news agencies. And uh, I don't know who of you like politics and world affairs, and I really enjoy Enjoy watching that and it seems these days if you if you look at social media it almost seems that social media knows more than than government intelligence because it's almost like they are predicting a strike here from Iran or in Israel or this or that happening it's I'm not sure how all these things work um, but it, it it's like it's all out there you know it's all out there and a long story short I think a lot of people currently feel bombarded with the overload of, of information and things that emails that they need to, to answer and WhatsApp and all the messages. So part of the why I said I want to speak slower is because just in my preparation, you know, I just don't want to rush through another sermon and rush through more scripture. Sometimes there's specific words that is so important that really, really speak to our hearts and where we need to stand still and appreciate it and val um, value what, what the meaning is actually. So when it says here, he presented himself alive to them. It's a place where the church can say amen. It's an important place where Jesus or scripture tells us or Luke and eyewitnesses says, in that time, in that 40 day period, he presented himself alive and that's, that's, the, that's part of the good news that we can share, that Jesus didn't just die and died and died in that, in that, um, in that tomb and stay there, but that he was risen. It says, after his suffering and many proofs, appearing to them during the 40 days, that is really significant, that is really special, and he speak to them about the kingdom of God. He was instructing them, he was talking about the things to come in the New Testament, etc., now, we know that in the, the, in the church age, or the new realm, as, as some theologians uh, refer to that, um, we live in that time. We live in this very special time. And 
Paul writes to Titus in, in, in 2 Titus 11 verse 14 and he, and he summarizes it in a, in a very accurate or in a very beautiful way and he says there, for the grace of God has been revealed. For the grace of God has been revealed. Now, we, I know that some of us love to come to church to pray. Some of us love to come to church to worship. And some of us love to come to get a message. And some of us love to come, for instance, maybe to serve or whatever the case might be. Now, if, if there's a few scriptures that you want to take home and write it in your little book, something that you want to apply during your life in the, in the next week, well, I think here it is. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. Now, when Paul writes and he says, bringing salvation to all people, it doesn't mean there's now a blanket approach and everyone is children of God and everyone is saved and believers. It means salvation is available to all people, to all nations and tribes and tongues, it's available. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures, okay? There's something I believe every one of us can work on. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil, um, we should live in this evil world with wisdom and righteousness and devotion to God. Amen? While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He gave His life, and that's also, once again, referring back um, basically to the cross and to the Easter message, if I can put it like that, verse 14. He gave His life to free us from every kind of sin. Church, something to take home. He gave His life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us His very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. I believe there's enough to chew on. That's for me, that's enough to work on during the whole week. I've read from the New Living Translation. I just want to read verse 14 from the, English, um, um, from the ESV, the English Standard Version as well. And it says in verse 14, Who gave Himself... For us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Who are zealous for good works. So I believe take those words, read them, write them down, do a bit of a search and, and see what is the meaning of all of that. In the Amplified Bible it ends with who are enthusiastic for doing what is good so father this morning we want to pray lord god and, and we want to pray scripture lord god that, that we will be a people lord god we thank you this morning that you have given your life lord god that we can be potentially freed from every kind of sin lord that, that you cleansed us lord god and that you made us your very own people lord god lord we see right back in redemptive history lord god that that you called the, the Hebrew people, Lord God, out of Egypt, out of slavery, Lord God. You call them to be your people, Lord God. And Lord, here in the, under the new covenant, Lord God, we see that, that salvation is available, Lord God, from the north to the east and the south and the west, Lord God, to every nation and tribe and tongue, Lord God, that we can come to you, Lord God, that, that we can be your people, Lord God, and, and that you can be our God, Lord God. And, and Father, I pray that, that our hearts, Lord God, will be in a place, Lord God, that our hearts will be in a place where we will be willing, Lord God, to be clay in your hands, Lord God, that we will be willing to be totally committed people by choice, Lord God, in terms of doing good deeds, Lord God, that we will be a people that's zealous, Lord God, for good works, Lord God. Yes, Father, sometimes we've got hurts or excuses or busyness, Lord God, or, or things like that where we say, I, I can't right now, Lord God. But Father, I pray that, that you will shape us, that you will transform us, Lord God, into a people that is zealous for good works, Lord God. People that wants to do your will in Jesus' name. Amen. So, a beautiful scripture in, in terms of our newness comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And there Paul writes and he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
The new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. Something that we can celebrate. Something that, that came from the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I read a beautiful, um, not a quote, but a passage from the author Douglas Moo. And it's not a, um, it's not a, uh, he's actually a, a very, very uh, good scholar. He writes some of the best commentaries on the book of, of Romans, for instance. Um, and he's, in his book, A Theology of Paul and His Letters, A Gift of the New Realm by Douglas Moo, he says in his book, in one, in one sentence, when he writes about this newness, he says, Christ became what we are so that we might become what he is. And I just thought it's something powerful to share. Christ became what we are so that we might become what he is. And he writes it in connection with uh, second, um, yeah, second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And it, it, there Paul writes and he says, God, if you wonder on what he's basing that, he says, Paul writes and he says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ became what we are so that we might become what he is. That's the process of sanctification and discipleship. It's a lifelong process where we leave the old nature in that sense completely behind and becomes more Christ-like. So this morning, I actually, when I saw Freddie, um, I, it reminded me of a, of a message that I preached. Now, not, neither me or Freddie can remember when it was, but probably about five years ago in Walfish Bay, and I think he was attending church. I can't remember if you led worship that morning. But that morning, I actually remember I spoke about the good news, and I, I spoke about what is so good about the good news. Now, I'm almost there once again, because the gospel is foundational to what we need to preach and do in this church age. So, if I have to ask the question, now, when I was preparing, I didn't think back about that sermon I preached five years ago, but this morning, I want to ask you a question. What would you say, and, and it's okay if we differ a little bit in terms of our view or the way we might choose to answer this morning, but what would you say, and, and I'm a little bit at lack of words, not because English is my second language, but I'm not sure exactly how to answer or to ask this question, but I wrote it down, what is the highest or the sweetest or the best part of the gospel? of the good news to you what is that part that makes the good news so good now i've already spoken last week about the death and the resurrection of jesus christ so so that's not what i mean when i ask this question what is that part that makes all the other things in terms of the new covenant so good should I give you a moment to think about it? What is that, that, that best part, that highest part, that sweet part? I, I'm not sure, sure exactly how to ask it. That makes the good news so good. Well, would you say it's justification by faith? Would it be maybe the forgiveness of our sins? Is it the, removable, the, rem, yeah, the removing of the wrath of God over our lives? Is it the redemption from guilt? Is it the liberation from slavery to sin? Is it maybe salvation from hell? Is it eternal life or, or entrance into heaven? Is it maybe the deliverance from pain or sickness or depression or, or all the things that we battle with? The list goes on because in that book there's 50 reasons why Jesus came to die from John Piper and what would you say this morning? What is in your heart, in, when I speak about personal revelation and personal application in your life as a believer, what would you say is the, is the sweetest part? What is that, um, you know, there's certain things that, that is important to me before I go to bed at night. I want to know where my family is. I'm the type of guy that, that checks three times that every door is locked and the God, dog's water is taken away and that they have their food and certain things are in place. But for me to have rest as a child of God, there's also certain things that is important. What is most important to you when, you, when we speak about the gospel and the good? And I will say every one of those examples that I get, got from Scripture 
is important. Every one of them is, is powerful and significant. But, but what I want to share this morning is maybe from, from where I stand, and maybe it's okay if you see it a little bit different, something that, that's a little bit like an umbrella for all these things. And I want to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. And I want to do it slowly because that's the, the note I made to myself this morning that we can really weigh and value what Scripture gives us and what Paul wrote here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 to 6, and I'm living, reading from the New Living Translation. It will be up there. I will quote the, the ESV as well. Therefore, since God in His mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God, and all who are honest know this. Verse 3. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, if the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. And I think there's, there's something here that's, that's of substance. There's, not that the rest isn't. But there's something that's, that's heavy. There's something that we can weigh this morning. Paul writes and he says, and he says well, there's, there's, there's an issue of blindness. There's an issue of those who cannot see. The God of this world, Satan, has blinded. We know there's hardened hearts and those that doesn't respond to the gospel. But what he says, they are unable to see the glorious light. Now, I'm not such a scholar in that sense, but I, I want to give you a little bit of a, of a dictionary um, explanation just now, just now about glory in the context of who God or the Trinity is. Because he says, they are unable to see the glorious light of the good news, the glorious light of the gospel. They don't understand this message about the glory of of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. You see, we don't. Um, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, that was verse. That was verse. Let me just see that I've got my verses correct. You see, verse five. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine into our hearts, so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. And I think there's something powerful. There's, there's something that we need to value, something that we need to appreciate. Yes, we can talk about sin and salvation and the return of Jesus Christ and all of that, but there's something in terms of who God is and about His glory and His light shining forth in the hearts of men that is really significant. Just run briefly read verse 4 and verse 6. It will be on the screen as well from the English Standard Version. And it says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light, church, the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. For God said, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I have to read this a few times to, to really grasp it and to, to really understand it because it's, it's heavy language that Paul is using here. But I, I do think what is plain in a sense to see and to observe is that the gospel 
is that the gospel is the gospel of the glory of Christ. And so easy, it's so when we run fast and we are busy and we are listening to the radio and there's a ping on the phone and another type of a ping on your email and another type of a ping on your Instagram and another ping here and there that we read it and we, and we hear it kind of, but that we don't read it slow enough that we see that the gospel is the gospel of the glory of Christ. And I think when we talk about the gospel and all the, if I can use the language, the benefits that it brings to us as God's people, that we are set free, that we belong to Him, that we are righteous, that we are justified, that we are adopted into His family. All those things are so, so precious. But I'm, I'm in a sense asking or making the statement or putting it out there that can it be that, that this and, and, and it, you can, as I said, you, you might see it differently, and that's okay. But when we, see, when we speak about the glory of Christ, and what I'm trying to, to put on the scale this morning is all the busyness and all the excitement and all the hype in this world versus what Paul is writing, and he says, it's a glorious gospel. It's the glory of Christ. Now, if we ask ourselves in terms of the good news, what can be better or heavier, or sweeter, or more significant than this glorious light, or the glory of Christ shining forth? I don't know. I don't have an answer. I don't know if you see it from a different angle, that's okay. But when God's glory filled the temple, it was awesome. And one of the reasons that we can actually be with God one day is because we Jesus paid the price, and that's a whole other sermon. But you see, can I just briefly give you a few examples about this word glory? And I want you to, to weigh it this morning. I want you to put it on the scale and to feel the, the heaviness of God's glory and the beauty of that. I went to Vine's dictionary, um, a very well-known one. I think it will be up there, the reference Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary of the Old and the New Testament. It's an old one. Who of you know it? B, I know you know it very well. Many of you will know it. It's, a, it's an old classic that has come for a long time. And I want to give you a few definitions or just examples about that word. When Paul says in, in, this, in, in, chapter, in verse 4, and I want to read it once again, slowly. He says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing this light. To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. There's something that, there's not two glories here. It's not the glory of God is different from the glory of Christ. It's the Trinity. It's, it's one glory that Paul is writing about. And here when we go to, to, to examples, it must be up there. Okay, it's coming just now. I just want to read you, to you a few examples or in, in Vine's dictionary. It says, It is used of the nature and the acts of God in self-manifestation. What He essentially is and does. What He essentially is and does as exhibited in whatever way He reveals Himself in these respects. And particularly in the person of Christ, in whom essentially his glory has ever shined forth and will and ever will do. And then there's references. There's something, church, where we can say, this is the pulpit, this is the floor, this is the sheeting of the roof and the concrete and the stainless steel and the wood and all these things. But God's glory, in a sense, is abstract. It's not, it's not something that I can dish out this morning. This is a, a book, it's a Bible with, with a black cover, etc. But there's something about God's glory where we have to turn to all of Scripture in the Old and the New Testament and see something and understand something about that word and, and the meaning of that word to take it back to the gospel and to what Paul is writing here and to understand. I've got all those examples. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a few of them. To you. 
It, okay, so it was exhibited in the character and the acts of God in the days of his flesh. 1 John 14, uh, John chapter 2, verse 11, at Cana, both his grace and his power were manifested, and these constitute his glory. So also in the res resurrection of Lazarus, the glory of God was exhibited in the resurrection of Christ, seen in Romans, and his ascension and exaltation. Likewise, on the Mount of Transfiguration, I've just put it on a list. Um, in Romans chapter 1, verse 23, we see His everlasting power and divinity are spoken of as His glory. His attributes and power as revealed through creation. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, the word denotes the, manifest, the manifested perfection of His character, especially His righteousness, of which all men fall short. In Colossians 1 verse 11, the might of His glory signifies the might which is the characteristics of His glory. In Ephesians, the praise, the praise of the glory of His grace and the praise of His glory signify the due acknowledgement of the exhibitation of His attributes and ways. In, in, in Ephesians 1 17, it speaks about the Father of glory. And then there where it says, be Vine says, of the character and the ways of God as exhibited through Christ to and through believers. And it gives 2 Corinthians 3.18 and 4.6 as a reference. And maybe you can go to your own resources and do a little bit research and go to the Old Testament and the temple, etc. Um, and, and read and study a little bit about the glory of God here. Now, as I said, there's not the glory of God is one glory and the glory of Christ is another glory. It's one glory of the Trinity that Paul is speaking about here this morning. So I believe when we, when we, um, when we look at the gospel and we, and we ask ourselves, what is so important about it? What is so beautiful about it? What is that part that, that, that places my heart and my life in awe? Well, zoom into this text and read it a few times. So if we ask ourselves the question, what keeps us from enjoying the ultimate good of the gospel? We can actually go, what is, what is, what is standing in the way of humanity, of people, or if we can call it the harvest, to experience or see or savior this beauty of the gospel? Well, Paul says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, there's the answer. He says, in their case, meaning people who cannot see it. He says, in their case, that is, those who are lost, those who are perishing, those who don't have this good, the God of this world called Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And I think we can all go back as believers to our testimonies and we can think there was a time where we were ignorant, there was a time when we were blind, there was a time that we couldn't see, there was a time when we were outside of the kingdom of God before we entered into, the, into God's kingdom and if I had a, a torch this morning, you know, and I, I had to shine it and it was something that blo was blocking it, we can see that the world at large do not see this light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ who is in the image of God. It's something that the enemy or Satan, Paul writes, he has blinded them to that. And church, I believe, as I said, we, we can, we can, it should resonate in our hearts because there was a time in my life that I certainly know I was ignorant, that I was blind to this light that Paul was speaking of. Paul also writes in 1 Corinthians and he says that, that you know, that, um, that carnal men cannot understand the things of God. It, it, it doesn't make sense to them. And, and I guess we can all relate to that. What allows us to enjoy the ultimate good of the gospel? What is, what is the, the portion? Or what is the, so I started off by asking, you know, what would you say is this, this most weight, weightiest part of, of, of the good news? What is the thing that is, that is really so powerful? And, and then briefly, what keeps 
people or humanity or a harvest. There's different ways that Scripture referred to that from enjoying the ultimate good. Well, it's a blindness. It's, it's the enemy that has blinded the hearts and the eyes or the sight of people. And if we have to ask a third question, what allows us to enjoy the ultimate good of this gospel? The answer Paul gives here is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. 6. For God, who said, let there be light in darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts, so that we could, that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. The New Living Translation. I also want to read it from the ESV. For, now, once again, you, you need to see us as carnal men, and we need to see the God of this universe and Jesus Christ, that, that God has um, made a life and, and that, that's not dead, that is risen. Here Paul says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown into our hearts, it's not the church, it's not the pastor, it's not, it's not the name of the church or anything like that. He says there, it's this God of ours that has shown into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We see when, God's, when God grants us sight. It's not something that we can self by ourselves switch on and off. It's not something that we can do. It's not something, I don't have this little genie in a bottle or this toverstocky or something that we, could, that we could use. It's a God thing. Because everything that we read from Genesis to the book of Revelation is about God's story. It's about His narrative and how He dealt with people. And here we see... As, as I said, I'm trying to give you the context, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, here's the, uh, the ascension of, of, of Jesus, and thereafter, it's the church age, the, this, this age that we live in, and I'm asking this morning, what is on our lips? What is so important? What is so beautiful about this good news? And it's this God, this, this Alpha and the Omega, He grants us sight when He grants us sight. That is... That is something beautiful. If we have to ask ourselves this question this morning in terms of the good news, in terms of the gospel, because, church, we shouldn't just remember, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, as I shared last weekend, we shouldn't just remember Jesus about the what and the why, what happened at, 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 at Easter. There's a part where we are His disciples. There's a part where we are commissioned. There's a part where we are mandated to go. There's a part where we need to take this good news and we need to talk about people, to do people about the cross and the resurrection and the essence and the heart of this good news. What can you and I, um, is there anything that you and I could do that would help other people see this heavy, high, beautiful part of the good news of the gospel. And it's actually hidden, not hidden, it's actually, I've referenced now to, to verse 4 and verse 6, and right in the middle, in verse 5, Paul gives us the answer what you and I can do about this. Paul writes, uh, or not, yeah, Paul writes here and he says, um, in between 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 and 6, he, um, he said, between, between blindness and sight, there's something that was done by man. There's something that was actually done by Paul. And he writes, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for the sake of Jesus Christ. Okay. So there's this, this God that's shining forth this beautiful, powerful light of the glory of Jesus Christ into the hearts of men. Paul says, what we proclaim, it's not ourselves, it's not our own message, it's something that has been handed down to us from Jesus Christ. We received it from Him. Jesus has appeared to many. He was the living testimony. He, and that's why we have these witnesses. And here Paul says, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. Okay, that's the message. That is what we can do about it. I know every Saturday, Daryl and Allura, I think there was actually someone that wanted to, to take, give a testimony this morning, but it, unfortunately he's not here and that's okay. Um, 
about you know, prison ministry and, and what the Lord is doing there. But you see, that is the message. That is what we need to take out and need to preach. Jesus Christ as Lord. So, as I said, we, we look back and we remember. We remember the cross. We remember what and why Jesus died, what he did for our sakes. And then we look forward. There's a part of looking back, but there's also a place in the here and the now. We look forward to the return of Jesus Christ, where Jesus will come back for his bride, etc. But there's also a place where we need to follow, where we need to obey what he wants us to do. In John chapter 4, verse 34 to 38, um, there's a part that we also prayed into this morning um, that, that helps us, maybe, as I said, to look away from our busyness. And here in John chapter 4, verse 34 to 38, I want to read it to you. Um, John is writing, he says, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see. It's one of those, those portions that I read slowly and I want you to, to read slowly. He says, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Look away from your tablet. Look away from your phone. Look away for a moment from your busyness, from, from the things that, that, that keep you uh, very busy. Yes, we should raise our children. Yes, we should love our wives. Yes, we should faithful and exercise. And, and nothing wrong with all of that. But it's, it's so beautiful where John writes about Jesus and he says, look up. Now, for those of us who, who are parents or have parented, you know, sometimes there was a time when the kids, it's almost like just at that moment before they get ice cream when they are small, you almost want to take them by the cheek and just say, hey, just look me in the eyes for a moment before you run across the road to, to get that ice cream. Be careful of the cars. Just, there's a message I want to give you. And here, to me, it's almost Jesus says, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see. Lift up and see that the fields are white for the harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering food for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I, Jesus, I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. I, I want to read it to you from the New Living Translation as well. Verse 34. Gen then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing His work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. Look up and see. Other translation, wake up and look around. The fields, it doesn't say the fields are white. It says the fields are already ripe for harvest. It's not in September or March next year or next year June that the fields or the harvest will be ready. He says, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for the harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages. And the fruit, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. That's, that's our mandate. That's, that's our reward in a sense. In the beautiful words, as Reinhard Bonke always said, to plunder hell and to populate heaven, to bring people into eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvest. And it's true. Then once again, this is the part Jesus already died, Jesus rose again, Jesus was soon to ascend it, and now it's the part he says, and I send you, I send you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Do you not say it is still four months until the harvest comes? Look, I say to you, raise your eyes and look at the fields and see they are white and ready for the harvest.